I'll uh, I'll pull up my share screen here. R Y E Bolivia share. Does that work for everybody? Does perfect. Looks great. All right. Let's see if my things work. Awesome. So I was in Bolivia in 2008, which was quite an interesting year in Bolivia. Um, so that was really President Evo Morales was elected in 2006, which was a big change in the country, the first indigenous president in Bolivia. Um, and then there was just, we were just talking to Olga that her daughter also did exchange and she was there during some water riots. I was there during just some civil unrest. The year that I was there actually, they uh, expelled the US Embassy, the US Ambassador, all Peace Corps, most American businesses. Um, and the only people that were left were a couple of us exchange students. Most actually got relocated to Chile, Argentina, or sent home. <clears throat> most of the students were in the lowlands in a big city called Santa Cruz, Bolivia, which a lot of the wealth is concentrated in that Santa Cruz region. I happen to be in the city of Sucre, which is the second capital of Bolivia. I was like one of the only exchange students in that area. It felt safe and I declined the opportunity to leave, AKA I said, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I stayed and I loved it. And Bolivia has always been super important to me. I'm still very close with my friends and family down there and we still talk all the time. Uh, and I'm like, you know, El Padrino, they like, Alijo, like the son of my exchange brother and all that. So it's still very important to me. Um, so here's, here's my family. Uh, first is Ippy, that's my brother on the left there. And then that's us doing a little motor motorcycle ride in La Tierra da Luna. So they have an area of Bolivia that is actually the most reminiscent and um, is closest to the moon's atmosphere or the moon's land. So it kind of resembles the moon. And that was us kind of on a trip the unique thing about my exchange year as well is that in Northfield, so I'm again starting off, sorry, I should have said this. I'm from Northfield. Hi, Vicki and Lee. So good to see you all. Uh, and in Northfield, it really is just like about rotary. A lot of that I think is from Vicki, uh, where it's just a thing. You're like, are you going to college? Are you going into work? Or are you going on rotary? Uh, the year that I went out, I think we were one of the largest uh, cohorts in rotary, to be honest. So, all of a sudden, everyone in the world knows a little town of 15,000 people in southern Minnesota, <laughs> which is always really fun and why I still always wear a Northfield hat because it will start a conversation anywhere you go in the world. It'll start a conversation with somebody and that's always been really fun. So my school experience was also quite odd. So I started out with the family whose son actually did exchange in Northfield. He lived with my best friend's family called the O'Neills, and I'm a Neil. So he was someone that I was very close to in Northfield. I was a junior, he was a senior. So when I graduated Northfield and I got accepted into Rotary and was given the country of Bolivia, I said, can we set this up at more of a direct exchange and go directly to his family, which is why I ended up in a city with very few other exchange students. Um, and so that was great and very welcoming at the very beginning. However, I wanted to find another family to live with. And so I was actually lucky enough to move in with Ippy after about two months and lived in like a downtown apartment with his family. Uh, but that was my school soccer team on the left. So I basically went to school for a little bit of education and a lot of soccer. Um, and so that was fabulous. And so then I ended up getting to play with them and then getting actually to play on a semi-professional soccer team while I was down there and getting to like sit on the bench and play a little bit with the professionals and training and things like that. So that was kind of my really funny life experience. And on the right was actually my homecoming after five years of being away. They threw a class reunion when I arrived five years later. And wow. so they threw a big party. We had 100% attendance of my school that was there, my graduating class. And we just got to all see each other after five years. And so that was super fun. Yeah, great. So, and I'm actually presenting back in, uh, in Bolivia. One of my friends down there is part of a rotary club and then a political club. And I'm actually getting to present to them about kind of what's going on in the United States here in the upcoming weeks, just to fill them in on what's going on in the U.S. Because we live in a very special place called South Minneapolis. That's where I'm at. Um, that has a lot of information for the world to share. 
So Spanish language, growing up in Northfield, I was really lucky enough to be in Spanish immersion. So half my day was taught in Spanish since I was in first grade. Uh, so first through fifth grade, all my math, all my sciences, and then we had Spanish uh, language and then Spanish reading since I was six years old. Uh, however, I always like to say that didn't stick at all. Like none of it made sense until I was immersed. And then all of a sudden conjugation made sense to me all of a sudden. Before that, I was like not a great student in Spanish class. I was trying to figure out my conjugation tables. And then all of a sudden, once I was in Bolivia and speaking Spanish, all of a sudden, oh, that's what the past means. Like you start to hear it and you start to figure out that grammar. Mm. So everything kind of came together at that point. The other kind of unique space is I was in, a, I was in a, a city where on the outskirts, almost everyone spoke primarily Quechua. And so there was the indigenous language. And so I had the opportunity to take some classes and kind of build a little bit. I by no means can hold a conversation in Quechua, but you get those little phrases. And so now in my work here in South Minneapolis, there's a very large Ecuadorian diaspora that still speaks Quechua, as they say, it's like Quechua three. There's three different types of Quechua, one in kind of Peru, one in Ecuador, and kind of one in kind of Bolivia area. Mm -hmm. um, but we still understand each other. So I can hit them with a little few of these, uh, not just Spanish, but in Quechua as well. And so that's been really wonderful for me. Lay, lay a little on us. Semana uh, Sanki Akika Karaiti, which means like, hey, how are you? Good morning. Manakanchukolka, <laughs> like, no, I nada, like I don't have anything. <laughs> the things you kind of learn. And then in my workplace, I still speak Spanish about 50 to 60% of my day is in Spanish. Mm -hmm. I have an entire work team that uh, are from Mexico and Ecuador and they all speak uh, Spanish as their first language. So most of my team meetings are in Spanish, about 50 to 60% of the clients that I'm working with are Spanish speakers. So every single day, I'm still learning new things. We all know it sounds like we had folks in Mexico and especially in Chile, there's just a lot of slang to like learn and just different words and even just what we all say for the word popcorn, right? Just that word changes in like almost every Spanish speaking country you go to in one way or another. Um, and so every single day after years and years and years, I am still learning Spanish every day. So I get, I feel very lucky about that. Traveling on exchange. <clears throat> Uh, Vicky knows a few of my stories. I was very lucky on traveling. Uh, I was able to spend a little over like two months actually backpacking the coast of Brazil. Um, this right here was on a, a part of a motorcycle trip I took uh, that followed the Che Guevara trail. So Che Guevara was killed in Bolivia. And now there's a city called Semaipata, which is kind of built in his honor. And it's like a kind of an international socialist utopia kind of situation in the middle of the Amazon, but like is at 2000 meters, so there's no mosquitoes. It is 60 to 72 degrees every single day. Um, it's just the perfect place. And there's a German chocolatier who is a traveler who just decided to sell all their belongings and stay. And there's a French vineyard. And so all these different countries and all these different people live in a town of about 2000. And there's like 45 different countries represented out of those 2000 people. Um, and a lot of them were travelers who just decided to sell their stuff and, and go. Um, but the other part was really fun getting to do the trip on Brazil. Uh, there was no kind of Euro trip. I know Emma was in Sweden. And so they did like a fun Euro trip of all the exchange students getting to go together. And that was an awesome like building experience and getting to meet all the other exchange students. Um, I didn't have that opportunity. That didn't really exist where I was. Uh, so I was able to do it on my own and really uh, I got to travel and meet with a lot of exchange students that I had met in the United States and in Minnesota. Um, again, in Northfield, the exchange students are very integrated, especially on our soccer team. Uh, so once you play soccer, you get to meet all the exchange students and we got to meet several along the coast in Brazil that I've met before. Unfortunately, not Felipe, just so you know, Vicky and Lee, <laughs> he wasn't one of them. And then Sucre Rotary Club. So this was also kind of an odd story. Uh, my club actually disbanded in probably the first two months of my stay. This is the only photo in the only meeting that I got to go to. Uh, it was an odd meeting in the fact that everyone drank a lot of whiskey. 
Um, it was a club that met at night of all the businessmen and it was a place for them to make deals and drink whiskey. And that was a thing. And then about two months, the president of the club got into an argument or a fight with some of the other members and they decided to disband. And so when that Rotary Club kind of disbanded in Sucre, that's when I moved in with my friend Ippy and kind of left the, my traditional Rotary family and moved in with a different Rotary family um, just because it was more comfortable after that whole spat. <laughs> so it was very odd. I still felt 100% supported by our US Rotary, our Minnesota Rotary. I never felt isolated or alone. It just happened. And sometimes those things happen in Bolivia. Yeah, during the orientations, we always say remain flexible. Things will happen. Well, That's, things happened, right? Things happen. And uh, even though I don't do yoga or anything, I'm quite flexible mentally. Maybe yeah. not physically anymore, but I'm mentally flexible. <laughs> So how it kind of exchange impacted my life. I mean, my job now is I work at the intersection of culture and food. I studied cultural anthropology at the University of Minnesota. That's actually where I met Emma. I can promise you, I don't think I would have studied cultural anthropology without this experience. I'd always loved culture. I was always fascinated by language, but really going down to Bolivia and really finding just how intense the cultural dichotomy of that country really is like there's a strong indigenous presence however kind of the minority european descendants really ran everything and had all the money and that's what Evo morales kind of came up out of was trying to fight for the indigenous sovereignty and those indigenous rights and so there was a huge stark contrast and i know we're in kind of a crazy place in our country but just about the stark racism that you would experience on just a day-to-day -day basis against the indigenous population was eye-opening to me, right? And finding how all these different communities and cultures have integrated themselves into the country of Bolivia really expanded my just kind of point of view of life. Having grown up in Northfield, as wonderful as it is, it's not necessarily the most diverse town growing up. Um, either is Iowa, which is where my whole family is from, uh, literally no diversity where my folks are from. Um, and so it really opened up that world to me and gave me the opportunity to study cultural anthropology, which is what I really found to be my, the love of my life, to be honest. And I still feel like I use it every day. Uh, I have to figure out the right food to serve the right cultures, the right immigrant and refugee communities in my workplace. Um, and so it's been something that's really allowed me to grow in my profession as well. As I said before, 50% of my time is speaking in Spanish. And then of course, service above self, always. I mean, that's so important to me. Um, I did the Rotary Youth Exchange, you know, I did Rotex. I used to interview people with um, North Star, excuse me with North Star and was doing that. And then I kind of left Rotary for a few years there trying to figure out where did we fit, right? I was a 27 year old that wasn't in a good job to be honest at that point. Like I was still at Pillsbury, but I didn't feel like I was high enough in my own professional career to join Rotary in my head and in my point of view, even after years of experience, it was always something that you got to do once you were like a big shot lawyer or a mayor or like something like that or my dad, who's a city manager of Edina. It was something that was above me in my career. And then that was what was really neat about finding this Twin Cities Rotary Eco Club that Emma and I are both a part of and both charter members of. So we kind of found this, uh, this group of really young folks that were excited about Rotary, but didn't really fit what we felt was like a traditional mode of Rotary and really felt like we wanted to use the power of Rotary kind of for the environment and sustainability. So how can we connect Rotary with something that we're also really passionate about? So we decided to go to a meeting that just happened to be a professor that we had at the University of Minnesota. And we went to the meeting and just really enjoyed this whole concept of every presentation is about sustainability or farming or clean water or chimpanzees in Tanzania, right? It was just so many things that we were so interested in. And so now we're just like way back into Rotary and I'm working with the district right now and just kind of doing bigger things within Rotary because I finally feel comfortable in my own skin to be a Rotarian. So that's been something that's been really nice in the past year. Um, because like, I still am gonna wear a backwards hat, like no matter what, you know? This is the first time I've put on a shirt and buttons in a long time. So 
you got the dressed up me even for an online presentation. <laughs> And so let me talk a little bit about the Rotary project that we're doing. So I just wrote a grant and accepted part of the Twin Cities Rotary Eco Club to put on solar panels on a hydroponic farm that I manage in North Minneapolis. So my role and my job at Pillsbury United Communities is I'm the food systems manager. So I manage two food shelves, two free community meal programs, five outdoor farms here in the city, and then one indoor hydroponic farm. Uh, this hydroponic farm, which you can see is like an old freight container. That freight container was actually used to ship sea bass from Chile to California. It was decommissioned uh, and no longer for use. And then we bought it and outfitted it as an indoor hydroponic farm using vertical farming techniques. So that farm, what you see there in that old cargo container is equal to about 2.5 acres of outdoor growing space that's in that container using hydroponics and using the vertical farming method that we're using right now. That's really and, crazy. Yeah, and, and we use it 24 seven, 365, every day is 72 and beautiful with a little bit of rain. And that rain just happens to have all the nutrients plants need. Um, so with that 2.5 acres of indoor growing space, it only uses five gallons of water a, uh, a week, a day, excuse me, five gallons of water a day. Um, and so that's about two toilet bowl flushes worth of water. And the reason for that being is that it's on a 3% grade. So everything, everything that falls down these like wicking strips, so it's on a big tube and the water goes down these wicking strips to give the plants all their nutrients and waters, goes into a trough and then actually is recycled back into the main container and then goes through our filtration process. That filtration process also has all the sensors that measures all the NPK, so your nitrogen, potassium, all those things. And then it actually changes the levels of the chemicals that it puts in depending on what the water needs. So you actually set those levels. Um, so with that, some of the amazing things about it is we see about a 95% germination rate. And anyone that kind of works in ag, if you can say, I have a solution for 95% germination, I mean, that's a huge deal for us, right? We also don't see pests, we don't have insects, we don't have squirrels, rabbits, uh, you never get drought, you don't have any of that. So we've been, so it's a really cool project. We just got it up and going and it actually sits in the parking lot, you can almost see at a grocery store that we own and operate. So that's a nonprofit grocery store in North Minneapolis, which is located in what was considered one of the largest food deserts in the country was that section of North Minneapolis. People were having to travel over an hour on the bus just to get to a grocery store. Hmm. And so now we built this grocery store in tandem with North Memorial Hospital and a bunch of foundations and Blue Cross Blue Shield as a way to really try to make affordable local produce for a community that had lacked a grocery store for years and years and years. Hmm. And so on site there, we also have community health workers, pharmacy techs, um, everyone, um, what else, like a dietitian. So let's find out, you, you just found out you have diabetes, you just got a diagnosis. What does that mean? We actually have someone that will walk around the store with you and meal plan and look at the vegetables and have recipes and teach you about cooking and how to read nutritional labels, just to really look at the grocery store experience in a new way and to really kind of look at health in a new way. I always like to say the, cho uh, the choice for healthy eating isn't made at home, it's made in the grocery store. Right. If you buy Oreos, guess what you're going to eat at home. Right. So that choice is made there. So when we make the healthy choice, the easy choice, that's kind of what we're trying to do. So with this really awesome project, we were able to get uh, funding from the district and working with our own Rotary Club for a twenty five thousand dollar grant that will actually put on solar panels on top of this container. So even though it's uh, super water efficient super efficient for growing, it uses a lot of energy. Uses about the same amount of energy as four typical households. So about four homes worth of energy because we keep the lights and the fans going, all that. So our goal is to offset some of that energy costs with solar panels on top. And then we're actually working to put solar panels on top of North Market. Because once we get the panels on top of North Market in conjunction with our panels, we'll be able to run this entirely off grid. 
Uh, the other very unique piece that we're working on right now is a water catchment system that will actually catch the water off the solar panels, be kept in a rain barrel, and then that can be what's fed through the system. And no one has done that with one of these uh, freight farms yet, one of these types of container farms. So my ultimate goal with that is to really have a demonstration farm of something that's completely off grid using solar electricity and then is catching its own rainwater. And then that way we can have an off grid system that has great agricultural output. My goal with that then would be to work with Rotary International and be able to bring that to countries like Guatemala or Yemen, places that don't necessarily have the same water abundancy as we have. Because I always like to say, if we, if we literally went water and just got off grid of water, we're not even on Minneapolis public water, we're gonna save about 22 bucks a year. Because water is cheap here, water is plentiful in our state, but that's not true the world round. So how can we prove a proof of concept here in North Minneapolis that we can then bring abroad? So Rotary is helping us with that entire piece. And then just recently, the Minnetonka Rotary, I gave a speech at and back in January, February, and they called me up just kind of knowing what I do and said, we have 2000 extra dollars. Is there any project you're looking at doing? So we're actually looking at making this skin for the outside of the freight farm to really talk about what is going on in that farm. Because you can kind of see in the previous slide, you don't really know what's in that container. Nobody knows what's in that container right now. So if it has this skin, we can really start that conversation about what are we doing. So this is just a concept. Y'all are some of the first people outside my agency to see this. Love so it's, it. still, it's still a work in progress, but it's another connection just giving a talk at the Minnetonka Rotary Club to really pay for this and get it done so we can talk to the community about how cool of a project this is. So in your little email thing, it said, what's some advice? And my advice is always be humble and listen. Everyone has something to teach you. So in my work, especially in the food shelves, and even today, I spend a lot of time like in the homeless encampments here in the city that we're all reading about in the news about powder horn and about this different homelessness. I'm there like four times a week doing service and talking to folks. And that's the community that I work very closely with. And if that's taught me anything, it's that you can learn something from everybody, right? It doesn't matter if that person is, is unhomed at this moment. It doesn't matter if that person is currently on or using drugs. They have something to teach you as long as you're humble and willing to listen. So one thing that's important to me and always has been is I would have the opportunity to do like a TEDx kind of talk in Indiana. And I wanted to wear my flannel because I'm just not going to wear a suit because we can't just listen to people in suits. People bring beautiful information, advice, and knowledge, no matter what they're wearing, no matter what their housing situation, as long as we're humble and listen. So that's my advice kind of for life. <laughs> and I think that actually kind of wraps up my talk. I think I might've spoken a little quickly. So if we wanna have some conversation, I'm very all about that. For sure, really great, great presentation. If you will please uh, kill your, your presentation, then we can have the larger, oops, there we go. Yeah, great. And then, um, yeah, thanks so much, Ethan. Just really, really interesting. If you have a question, please take yourself off of mute as is customary. And I'll call on you, I'll, I'll start though. What, what's the price for a box, a, a, a shipping container farm? You know, take the solar out of it. You mm -hmm. put this together, you built it. Are there kits to do this? Did the foundation just contract? Are there you know, thousands of these around the country that we don't know about? I've never even heard of it. It's a great concept. Yeah. There's hundreds, I don't know if thousands, but it is a company out of Boston, Massachusetts called Freight Farm. And you do, you, you buy that kit and it comes with everything you need. And then you set it up like an Ikea kit. So we drilled every irrigation hole, set up every tower, put in every wicking strip. It took forever. Uh -huh. um, and the cost of that was just over $100,000 for that okay. container farm. Um, okay. And then the operating costs, when you kind of factor in the plugs, so it's, it's soil free, so no soil is used. You actually use coconut core. So everything's grown in coconut core, um, which then is composted afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and then your operating cost is about fifteen to eighteen thousand per year. And then what's per the year. what do you find the return is at the market for the amount of produce that is 
produced? I mean, is it, are you covering costs? Is it a five-year payoff? Is it a one-year payoff? Like what's the, what's the economics of that? Yeah, so the ideal being that it's a three to five-year payoff. I will say we sold our first crop out of that uh, about three weeks ago. So that was the first time we made our first sale out of it. Yeah, before that, we had it running. Thank you, it's, a, it's amazing. I'm so glad to have that off my plate. And we hired a hydroponic farmer that runs that. Because uh, before that, it was me and our outdoor farmer just trying to figure out technology, um, which Kirk can say, my wife was in here trying to show me how to do a presentation because that was the first time I did a presentation on Zoom. My work has been entirely in person. <laughs> it hasn't really stopped. Uh, and so now that we have someone running the operation, the goal is three to five years. Um, but of course, we received that from a foundational grant from the Cargill Foundation. So Cargill paid for it and then pays us to help run it. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about Pillsbury, the name. Are you related to Pillsbury Food? Is Pillsbury United or .org related to Pillsbury, the food giant? Or oh. Yeah, thank you for that question. Great question. No. So we have been a social service agency in Minneapolis for 141 years. We're actually one of the original social service agencies. And our first seed money to ever start was from John Pillsbury, who was the grandson of the founding of Pillsbury Flower. And that is kind of the last time we've really worked with the Pillsburys. So we don't even get money from the Pillsbury Foundation now, yeah. uh, to be completely honest. Yeah, so yeah. it's just well, a name only. <laughs> sounds good. Well, hey, I will move on to Vicki and Lee, who have their, uh, their computer unmuted. I would ask you questions for about the next three hours on this topic. But let somebody else get in there. Vicki, go ahead. Well, I think we need to have a little social time with, uh, with these two, uh, sometime John and invite the rest of the group too, but those are post COVID days, I think. What, uh, Ethan, what kind of vegetables are in there? What do you have tomatoes and lettuce and broccoli or what is it? Great question. Uh, so things like tomatoes wouldn't be able to grow in there. So anything with like really a complex root structure, um, so we call it the leafy green machine. So think of all your leafy greens and herbs. And for me, like when this came onto my plate, I was coming from the food shelves and feeding a lot of people. Our food shelves, have, like just since COVID, have served uh, 8,500 unique families since COVID started. So it's working at scale. And I always said, am I really alleviating hunger by growing the best Thai basil in the world? No. But can we sell really great Thai basil at a really reasonable price so people can buy it and then we can recycle those profits back into our food system where we can buy bulk produce from farmers and from second harvest in the food group and make a bigger impact like that? Yes. And so really a lot of our work and a lot of our farm work isn't always about feeding people at scale. It's about changing people's relationship with food talking about the farmer. When we're in the grocery store, we always say like, take a piece of produce that's about a dollar and your farmer got about maybe three cents of that. So just kind of changing the relationship of what that looks like. Um, but we are very limited in what we can grow in there. So one, one further question with that, uh, do the people who buy the produce get to come and see where their food is from? Uh, so we don't have people in there yet because of COVID. Okay. Uh, we actually have a live stream. So we'll set up a live stream that then there's a camera or a TV screen above the checkout lanes that you can see kind of like a 10 minute loop of exactly what your harvest and what took place where your produce wow. came from. That's great. Mm -hmm. Margaret, thanks, Vicki. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Ethan. Um, I'm wondering um, how you became involved in working with kind of community agriculture or food shelf efforts and and I I think it's really cool that kind of the Spanish connects in I'm wondering if there were kind of farming um, efforts that you participated in in Bolivia too or or if that aspect connected at all with exchange mm -hmm. yeah uh, so I've been working at Pillsbury for nine and a half years now I came back from exchange I worked at Ikea for a year and then actually got a job at Pillsbury since I was 21. I'm now 30 and coming up on 10 years at my agency. Wow. So I've just kind of worked my way up. I actually started in the food shelf volunteering uh, with adults with disabilities and then started bringing adults with disabilities to gardens, community gardens, to have them really interact with community and bring something to the community kind of deal. 
um, and get them out of their group homes kind of thing. And then it's just kind of snowballed. I got a job in the food shelf and then became the food shelf coordinator, did a good job. That coordinator left, I became the manager. The farmer left, I became the farmer. Um, and it's just kind of snowballed for me to be managing kind of this bigger system. I do come from a line, I'm a seventh generation farmer and laborer from Iowa. So my folks grew up uh, farming in Iowa and then everyone all the way down to 1858, we're, we're still farming the same land down in Iowa. So it's always something that was ingrained, but my parents went to college, got out of the farming industry and raised us in Northfield. So we were always kind of on the agricultural periphery. Um, and then so many of us in Northfield now that grew up on this periphery are very much engaged in agriculture now. So there's a lot of young folks just like me and from Northfield that have kind of grown up on the outside of it and now are just very, very intentional about the type of agriculture we're taking part of because it shaped our lives and it shapes a lot of our lives that grow up in rural spaces surrounded by corn and not really talking about it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. You talked about the people you work with. Can you tell more about that? Because you, you did touch on the food shelves, but how, where do you, where do your people come from and how can we apply for a job or how or it works differently maybe? Love to know a little about that. Yeah, of course. So Pillsbury United, we were born out of a program from the Settlement House Movement. The Settlement House Movement was a concept that was really created in the 1800s in London, England, as an idea of actually having these different settlement houses that people went and lived in in the community because they knew that outsiders don't always know the best solutions for these micro communities that we serve, these neighborhoods that we serve. And this was specific about working with immigrant and refugee communities. Immigrants and refugees coming from China and India and Africa and Guyana all need different types of services. And we need to make sure we tailor those services to the communities in which we serve. So Pillsbury, we have four community centers throughout Minneapolis, one in the Phillips neighborhood, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. So it's South Minneapolis. Uh, that's where I speak a lot of Spanish and then work heavily. So that's actually the largest urban Native American community. So one of the gardens we have is literally called Meshkiki Gitagan, which is Ojibwe for medicine garden. And we help uh, native organizations grow native medicines for the Indian Health Board, for their native doctors to treat native patients with native medicines in the heart of the city, right? So cool. another, and then another site that I manage is called Brian Coyle, and that's at the base of Cedar Riverside. So if you're ever driving on 35W and you see the big buildings with the colorful windows, right at the base of that. And so there we have to tailor our community and our languages to Somali and Oromo and Eritrean. And Minneapolis is home to such a large uh, amount of immigrant and refugee communities from around the world, right? One of the largest populations of Somalis, Oromos from Ethiopia, Eritreans, Hmong, you know, Liberians, like there's all these different pockets here in the city. And so our community and our uh, workers really reflect that. I always kind of joke, I'm the only white guy you're gonna run into at my work. Uh, everyone else is from the community. Everyone else speaks a different language as their primary language. I learned Spanish as my second language, but I'm the only white guy you're gonna see in my work. And so our other site is in North Minneapolis, working with like generational African-Americans, and so we tailor our programs and everything to the community in which those community centers are based. Are those other three gardens traditional like outdoor gardens, summertime only gardens? Yes. Yep. So we have some hoop houses and stuff that do season extension, of course. Um, and then those are production sites that we sell into North Market. And then we also have uh, CSAs that we do for Indian Health Board and Native American Community Clinics. Because something we hear a lot of is doctors telling people to eat healthier with right. no concept of food accessibility or yes. food affordability. Yes, sure. So we, we sell them a very discounted CSA for their doctors to actually prescribe healthy food. And then they do cooking classes and have menu cards, things like that. That's amazing. Um, back over on the, on the shipping container um, garden the, in the hydroponic, how is that heated in, in the winter and can solar really provide all the energy that it takes to keep your plants from dying when it's 25 below outside. 
the amazing thing is just it's insulation and then all the heat comes from humans like working in there and then the lights that keep the plants alive and insulation so we actually have to cool it in the winter no matter what no um well. yeah and so it's kind of like when you find out i don't know if y'all know this but the mall of america does not have a heating system right it's entirely heated by passive solar windows and then human movement um, and so when things are well constructed, you don't really need all that much heat if you have, yeah. So good insulation. <laughs> For sure. Other questions? Lee, this is right up your alley. You must have a thousand questions like I do. <laughs> We've met at the brewery before to talk it out. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Of course. Sure, okay, um, yeah, so I was curious, what advantages or challenges do you see to doing this work in the Twin Cities? Um, so I know like you've mentioned Cargill, you've mentioned um, Sport from Rotary. I personally am familiar with like Compatible Technology International, CTI, that does mm -hmm. agriculture innovation. So I'm curious, like do you find that there's more advantages to being here or do you find that there's like some challenges to the Twin Cities for this type of work? I would say it is primarily advantageous. Minneapolis and the Twin Cities, we are home to so many Fortune 500 companies. We're home to a very philanthropic community. We are number two in volunteer hours outside of Utah. There's a lot of money. We are famous the world over and a lot of our companies are based on agriculture and food and food distribution and logistics. It's what made Minneapolis, Minneapolis. And so being in the food world here, like, I think it's mostly advantageous. Um, yeah, to be honest. Uh, and then we always have a lot of customers. I mean, Minnesota and Minneapolis is such a home of the have versus have nots, right? Like our disparity rates are through the roof. Like that's also something we're almost number one in in the country is our disparity, right? So a lot of my role is how do I connect those two things, right? Is how do I connect the people that are literally living in camps right now that don't even have porta potties to go in how do we connect them with the dollars that the cargill foundation has right and where what are the needs that those people have and how can we make that a reality because really my ultimate goal on our food shelf is that we connect people to employment services and to other health services because if they come to our food shelf i can promise you they have nine ten other issues that they're facing that aren't food insecurity that are actually leading them to be food insecure. And we need to look at that in a holistic manner. In Pillsbury, we're a large enough organization that we do have employment services. We have a daycare for people. We have bike shops and internships. And so we're kind of a very holistic organization. Um, and I think that one of the reasons we can do that is because of Minneapolis. And I just don't know of other, met like there are other metros that have that, but. Minneapolis is my home, so. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan, Elka. What, what does the day look like for a homeless person? The typical day for getting their food and supplying enough for their family. Great and question. That's probably not a yeah. appropriate word, but. No, that's okay. And we're all we're all working towards more progressive language. And there will be something that uh, you could say last month that I won't be able to say this month kind of deal. So <laughs> you're good. And so one thing I always like to really point out is in our food shelves, 65% of our food shelf users are full time employed. We're working with a lot of people that are trying to make ends meet as well. Um, so we have to talk about things like minimum wage, we have to talk about workers rights and what we do. Uh, yes, there is a large homeless population, but by no means is that the largest percentage that we serve. And I think that's uh, really important to recognize that this is neighbors helping neighbors. If I were to speak in, I, in generalities, and of course, homeless encampments and homeless folks are not a monolith that live a day-to-day -day life. I know many homeless that wake up every day and go to work. There are also people in these camps that work full time that have been evicted because they because of raising house prices in Minneapolis. It's hard to find rent here, especially if you're working at minimum wage, especially if you're maybe undocumented and you lost your job due to COVID. You did not get $600. You did not get unemployment. Uh, we can argue all day about undocumented folks, but they are here. They do live among us they, and they deserve that respect. And now a lot of them didn't get anything during this COVID time. So with that said, 
the encampment that happens to be across the street from me, which is about maybe 65 to 70 tents, is one of the hardest, like, hardest sites. And so I go to many homeless sites and all of them have different feels, right? Where Em and I live, there's a homeless group just on 42nd and Nicollet that's at MLK Park. And it's almost like you're camping in a way, right? People are sitting in chairs and they're reading books and it feels very nice. The one across the street from me happens to be the hub for heroin and prostitution in the city. Uh, I narcan someone today and <laughs> had to pull them out of an opioid overdose just today. Uh, you see the constant dealing, you see that kind of things happening. So for meals, like we serve at a building literally across the street, many folks don't even come over for meals. We bring meals to them and then volunteers will bring meals and everything they need uh, directly to the encampment. And many of those folks don't necessarily leave that small city lot. Um, and that just happens to be that particular encampment across the street from us. Um, but it's very, it's a heavy feel at that encampment. And by uh, across the street from us, you mean from the market in North Minneapolis? At our community center in South Minneapolis, excuse at me. community center. Hmm. Yep. So it's right across the street from our community center in Phillips. Got it. All right. So a lot of the homelessness that, we're, that we talk about here in the city, that there's lots of articles written on, is almost always in the heart of South Minneapolis. You actually don't see it over North Side all that much, to be honest. Do you, do you have a rationale or reason for that, why that might be? You know, I don't. I mean, I've worked on both sides of the city in social services. And again, Minneapolis is a fairly segregated city in a lot of different ways, whether that was from government redlining or housing covenants that existed here for so long or self-segregation of people moving to group parts of the city where other people spoke their language and that they knew somebody. So I think both of those things work in tandem. Um, but it just happens to be more in Southside. And I'm not sure why I see that so much more. But Powderhorn, I would say five of the six biggest homeless encampments are all within about four miles in South Minneapolis. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because South Minneapolis got more parks back in the day because there wasn't such an investment in Northside. So there's less parks to be homeless in because the city didn't invest in parks. Yeah, I heard a stat <laughs> one time that anywhere within the city of Minneapolis, which would be inclusive of the North Side, there's a, mm -hmm. uh, a park within six blocks of every home by design, like this goes Absolutely. back to the 1800s. I don't know if that's true or not, but I had heard that. It is. Yeah. It's, what, yeah. it's what makes us one of the number one park cities in the country. We won best park system like in 2014, 15, 16, 17, lost in 18, got it back in 19. <laughs> Great, sounds good. Uh, time for about one more question here. I'll take it. Do you oh. um, give tours? Yes, I was gonna ask about that. That's basically my job now. I just, I give tours and I weed gardens as I give tours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could tour my garden. <laughs> <laughs> you would love that, right? <laughs> I'll get an intern to do it for you, Vicki. <laughs> yeah, so one last little cool bit about our work. So one of the other pieces of Pillsbury is we own a bike shop that focuses on teaching home, uh, youth experience in homelessness, how to build and maintain bikes and become bike mechanics in this city. Um, but they also have a bike courier service. So this year, we actually debuted this where there are produce distribution um, are, is all done via bicycle, via these youth that were experiencing homelessness that are all paid 15 bucks an hour. They bike from South Minneapolis, pick our produce, and then they go all the way north side and sell our produce into the market. And then they pick up anything that was not sold in the market, they then pick up. So our deliveries happen on Tuesday and Friday. So anything that wasn't sold over the weekend is picked up on Tuesday by our riders and driven right back to our community meal programs and cooked up that same day. So with that, we've eliminated fossil fuels from our entire food system in our urban agriculture department with that. And then also we're seeing about a 90 to 92% success rate for anything we grow is either given out to the community, sold into the market, or brought into our community meal programs. And is so that's kind of been our two big successes this year is 90% success rate on our produce, and elimination of fossil fuels from the entire food system. Uh, 
That's great. Well, Thank you so much. Um, your e the uh, the Eco Club. When do you guys meet? And are you doing meetings on Zoom for anyone who may be interested? We are doing Zoom. And Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was just this Tuesday, so I believe it's the first and third Tuesday of every month. First and third Tuesday. And is there a website that you can uh, type into chat? Either you or Emma can do that. Facebook, Twin Cities Rotary Eco Club. Oh, that and that's is... in the morning, isn't it, Ethan? It is in the evening. Oh, evening. Okay. Yep. So it's an evening club with uh, lower fees as well, even when we we're meeting in, in person, try to make it more accessible to a younger demographic. So our club, kind of the odd thing about it is, I think it's like 65% or 70% of our members are under the age of 40. That's awesome. And Emma just hit you with the club runner link in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Awesome. Emma would be fun to hear from sometime too. She's they're I, quite a dynamic duo together. I heard you need a speaker oh, next week. <laughs> oh, she's the speaker next week? I said I oh, heard they needed one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Emma could be good. <laughs> Thanks, Ricky. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, awesome. And you as well. Ethan, we have an old electric bike that has a brand new uh, battery. Yeah. Would, would you be able to put it to use if somebody could fix it up a little bit? Like new yeah, Absolutely. That's what the bike shop is for. So they just right. got a, they just got their first e-bike and it's like made the whole thing so much easier. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, you could, you could pull things with it and yeah. Well, we'll connect offline and, and I'll, I'll go down to Northfield to pick it up. All right, huh. that'd be great. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Um, let me just share my screen here. We, um, let's see here. We always end our meeting. People can take themselves off of mute. We always end our meetings with the uh, Rotary Four Way Test. So I will wait for people to unmute here. They're still around. Okay, Rotary four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? The truth. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Will it be beneficial to all concerned?